Is it just me, or does this seem like every new camera is more expensive than the last? But what if I told you that these modern cameras hardly scratch the surface when it comes to the most expensive cameras ever sold? I spent the last two weeks researching for the most rare, interesting, and bizarre cameras that I could find. I discovered several types of photography that I didn't even know existed. Just for the sake of this video, to keep it fun, I did group up a few cameras and excluded all cinema cameras because it would just made this video a fanboy tribute to Leica and Ari. And now, let's get into it. You've you probably heard chickens were the original camera gimbals, but do you know what the original drone was? Now you're probably guessing a hot air balloon or some type of kite, but those were pretty expensive fairly rudimentary and attracted a lot of attention. You needed someone to operate the camera and the chances of the camera crashing to the ground were pretty significant. On top of that, these systems needed a lot of space and could only really capture the highest vantage points. So what other technology could they have utilized? Well, have you not noticed that your local pigeons seem to have only gotten larger over the last few years? I'd like to introduce you to pigeon cameras and the world of pigeon photography. Okay, I gotta take this thing off. <laughs> Now, I just want to apologize for all my pronunciation mistakes right now before I get too far in this video because there's going to be a lot of them. <laughs> this type of photography originates in Kronberg, Germany back in 1907. An apothecary named Julius Neubrunner, Neubrunner, okay, I'm going to go with that, who also considered himself as an amateur photographer, had a problem. You see, Julius would receive his medications from a sanatorium the next town over by pigeon. And these pigeons would carry a payload of up to 75 grams. However, occasionally one of his pigeons would get lost and would show up mysteriously well fed four weeks later. So Julius was wondering what happened to his pigeons? Julius had this crazy idea of equipping his pigeons with automatic cameras to trace their paths of where they were going. This thought led him to merge two of his hobbies into a new sport and thus pigeon photography was born. He developed a lightweight miniature camera out of wood and aluminum that would weigh somewhere between 30 to 75 grams which he specially trained every pigeon for their payload. He then applied for a patent, but was rejected because the office didn't believe the idea was possible, that there was no way a pigeon could carry that type of load. So to prove this invention, he released a pigeon 100 kilometers away from his house. The bird basically beelined it home, flying anywhere between 50 to 100 meters in the air, with the camera periodically taking a photo throughout the entire flight. Using these images as proof, he was granted his patent. But the craziest thing is, is that the story keeps going on. During World War I, the state apprehended all his equipment and pigeons and used it for the war, which proved to be advantageous in several battles. And then using what they learned in World War I, they developed the technology even better, training dogs to carry and release pigeons behind enemy lines. And at this point, each pigeon was capable of taking up to 200 photos per flight. Now, just to lead this back to the camera in question, just a country over it, there was a Swiss clockmaker named Christian Mitchell. He was assigned to the Swiss Army's Carrier Pigeon Service in 1931 and began work on adapting Julius's camera to 60mm film, improving it with a built-in clockwork device to control the delay. Mitchell patented this new design in 1937, but failed to sell the idea to the Swiss Army. He created an estimate of 100 copies of this camera, and three were auctioned off between 2002 and 2007, which sold for a price of $15,000, which is pretty pricey for a rudimentary drone. But considering that DJI didn't release their first drone until 2013, I guess it makes sense. So if you want to learn more about pigeon cameras, I actually left a link below, as well as other videos that I found regarding any of the other cameras that I'm about to talk about. Now this next camera is for all you true crime lovers and cold case solvers out there. Imagine being able to go back to a crime scene and finding new evidence that wasn't found. Well, this camera is a portal to the past and can be used to reflect on a crime scene days, months, or even years later. And it really is something else in comparison to today's standards. This also has to be one of the funniest commercials I've ever seen in the driest way possible. Which if you want to watch the full eight minute ad, I'll have a link below. This is the $40,000 Panoscan Mark III, and it's a 360 camera that was marketed for forensics use. It would create 360 degree images 14,000 times the resolution of video, or about 600 megapixels, and takes about three minutes to complete one single scan. Using their software, you could select any two parts in the room and triangulate the distance from each other, which they proclaim is gonna be an eighth of an inch accurate. So if you're interested in becoming a forensic photographer, I'm sure you know which cameras you're gonna start looking at. Now to bring this camera back to something that's a little bit more modern, how about I talk about the craziest point and shoot camera ever? And no, I'm not talking about the Fuji X100 that I'm still waiting for. Yo, Henry, where my camera at, bro? This one has 150 megapixels pixel sensor that's physically six times larger than the X100 sensor and is essentially the same size as 645 film. This is the $62,000 Phase 1 XC camera, a medium format point and shoot. 
Now, Point Shoot is going to be used a little bit loose here, but it does have a really nice wooden handle, and it's equipped with a fully manual fixed 23 f5.6 lens which is about a 16 millimeter equivalent on full frame. Now, I don't know who's actually using this camera, but it's supposedly supposed to be used for architecture and landscapes. It doesn't even have a hot shoe and the entire interface is a touchscreen. Phase One's reasoning for making this camera a fixed lens camera was that you could crop down your images into any focal length due to the enormous amount of pixels that the camera has. But this is where the camera kind of gets a little weird too, because this isn't a true point and shoot. The back of the camera is removable and it's just Phase 1's $45,000 IQ4 sensor that works with their XT and XF systems, but it also has a special touchscreen interface while connected to the XC body. The reviews I watched of this camera mostly say it's a beautiful camera, but it's very slow. Just booting up the camera involves a loading bar. Personally, I think this is more of a concept camera, but I do love the idea of having a medium format point and shoot camera down the line. If you make a more practical version of this camera, please give us back our buns and dials. <laughs> now this next camera is if you want to bring your bougie bar to the absolute max. Do you already have 24 karat golden coated AirPods? How about a gold plated DualShock controller? Or if you have a little buddy running around, how about a gold plated harness? Well, if you already have all these, your collection is still incomplete without the $58,000 gold plated Lux Nikon DF camera designed by Brick. This is the same as the retro Nikon DF, but wrapped in 24 karat yellow gold and stingray leather. Only 77 of these these bad boys were ever made. It also comes with an equally blinged out 14 to 24 millimeter f2.8 lens. It may be the first time I've ever considered keeping my lens hood on. The lens cover and hood are also coated in gold. And if you're not sold yet, it also comes with a custom zero Halliburton camera case, which is also coated in 24 karat yellow gold. Now you may be wondering who is Brick? According to their about me page, they're a lifestyle brand, but I'll just let you read this part for yourself. There are those who are merely rich, and then there are those who are fabulously wealthy. Brick is an all-encompassing lifestyle designed to flaunt a gilded life. All of Brick's products are designed to be nothing less than fabulous, with the sole purpose of making their devices the envy of the masses. Demanding respect, available only to the select few, Brick is luxury on display. It keeps going on from there, but I think you get the gist. Now this next camera is pretty legendary, and it feels more like a folktale than a real camera. This one originates back to 1839, to the very beginning of the photographic era. Now you may already know that the father of photography is Joseph Niepce, but after his passing, it was actually his business partner Louis Daguerre that actually perfected it. However, Daguerre was having financial difficulties at the time and was forced to sell his invention to the French government, after which the French king declared it as a gift to the world and just freely gave it to everyone, which didn't stop Daguerre from capitalizing on the opportunity. He designed and created the very first commercialized camera alongside his brother-in-law, Alphonse Giraud. Thus, the Daguerre Giraud camera was created. Each of these cameras had a golden plaque, which had Giraud's mark and Daguerre's personal signature. It was essentially just a velvet lined wooden box with a lens attached to it. Although it didn't win any awards, Gro did win a silver medal for a jewelry box that same year. Now if we fast forward to 2009, one of these sold at the West Lick Photographic Auction for 732,000 euros to an anonymous buyer from the Asian mainland who bid through the phone and was quoted to have said, wow, that was cheap. Right after he trumped another collector and a museum trying to obtain the same camera. They're crazy rich. We got the Beijing billionaires, the Taiwan tycoons. Hey, before we actually get to the next camera, I just want to say thank you for watching my videos. If you didn't know, I started this channel less than a year ago, which at the time of making this video, I'm just passing 4,000 subs now, which is mind blowing to me. Now I'm still figuring out this whole YouTube thing out, but I'd appreciate if you could give this video a like or subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. So if you're feeling out to it, Thank you. Now, where you're standing now, where do you think is the furthest place you could leave a camera? A remote webcam on the tops of Nepal? Or maybe a deep sea research drone at the bottom of the oceans? How about setting one off into space on a satellite? Well, to my knowledge, the Webb and Euclid's telescopes are probably the furthest ones from Earth, but there is a few cameras out there that I know of that are probably a strong third. And unlike those satellite telescopes, two of these actually made it back to Earth. This is the Hasselblad 500EL used by James Irwin during the Apollo missions, which sold for 660,000 euros or 940,000 USD at the Westlich auction in 2014. Now you may want to sit down and buckle up because this one's going to be a rocket ship of spicy, controversial information. You see, there was 14 Hasselblads used for the Apollo missions and all of them were intended to be left on the surface of the moon to spare up weight for moon rocks. So if you thought Fuji was the originator of disposable cameras, think again. 
So what made James Irwin's camera so special that it was allowed to come back to Earth? Apparently the camera malfunctioned on him, prompting him to bring him back for inspection rather than abandoning the camera on the moon. Now after this incident, the details kind of become fuzzy, but this camera somehow gets transferred into a private collector's hands. And this is where all the controversy starts to pour in. Now in 2012, Obama signed a legislation that allowed astronauts the right to retain and sell artifacts and souvenirs that they acquired throughout their missions. However, this Hasselblad didn't fall into this category since it was returned for technical reasons, not as a personal souvenir, creating ethical and legal ambiguities about its sale. And on top of that, the camera wasn't the only thing Irwin brought back home from space. During the Apollo 15 mission, Irwin along with his crewmates, David Scott and Alfred Warden, carried approximately 400 unauthorized envelopes with stamps postmarked on the moon without NASA's approval. These covers were intended to be sold to a private German stamp dealer for a profit. These envelopes came to light after the mission, leading to a huge scandal. NASA reprimanded the astronauts and the envelopes were seized. The scandal highlighted issues of commercialization and ethics within the space program, which also raised eyebrows about the legitimacy of the Hasselblad camera malfunctioning. Although Irwin and his crew returned the money that they received, the astronauts were called before our closed session of the Senate and never flew in space again. Which is a crazy story if you actually believe we landed on the moon in the first place. There's an open discussion about the 38 that's etched on the camera plate doesn't actually line up with NASA's own photos. Anyways, to bring this back to the actual camera, NASA's Hasselblad 500EL was pretty special. This essentially was a modded and motorized version of the Hasselblad 500C. The EL was stripped down to the bare metal, removing all the body coverings to reduce weight. And since using a viewfinder wasn't possible while wearing a spacesuit, this was also removed. These cameras were mounted to the chest of astronauts and was painted silver to reflect heat and help manage the extreme temperatures, fluctuations of space. It also used special thin film developed by Kodak to prevent any buildup of static electricity, as well as allowing more magazine capacity. And the lenses for this camera was actually designed by Zeiss. The lens sold in the auction was the Biogon 60mm f5.6 lens, which had elongated tabs that allowed astronauts to use the lens with their gloves. Just as a side note, there was a second Hasselblad camera that came home during the Apollo 14 mission, which is less talked about. It was attempted to be sold at a separate auction starting at 80,000. However, NASA filed a lawsuit asserting that the camera was government property and the listing was taken down. That camera now is part of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, which still leaves 12 Hasselblads on the surface of the moon. If you want to make a quick round trip for a potential million dollars a pop, if not more for the very first camera on the moon, or if you want the cheaper Soviet version, the Arsenal Kiev SKD space camera also sold for a measly 57,000 euros. From this point in the video, I'm actually going to need to sell two or three of those NASA Hasselblads to afford any of these next cameras, which essentially are going to be all like us from here. So instead of laying out all the similarities between all these cameras, I'm just going to touch base between the two that stood out to me the most. Do you remember this design or this and this? And no, this isn't the new Apple trash can computer. This is the one of a kind Leica Red M, specially crafted for the Red Auction which aims to raise funds for the global fight for AIDS. This was designed by John Ive and Mark Newson, renowned designers for products at Apple amongst other projects. This camera took 85 days to design and involved nearly 1,000 prototype parts. The body has over 21,000 laser cut perforations out of a single block of aluminum. It also comes with a matching APO Semicron 50mm f2 spherical lens and packs a full frame 24 megapixel sensor. The camera sold in 2013 at Soda Bees and it sold for $1.8 million which might make this the most expensive modern camera for this century. But even then, the cost of this camera is dwarfed by its older brother, a 1920s Leica Zero, which is also known as the Null series. It's a milestone camera in the history of photography known as the world's very first 35mm camera, with less than 25 of these ever produced. The Leica Zero was a prototype series of the commercially available Leica One. Now, the one I'm talking about has a serial number of 105 and was once owned by Oscar Barnack, the inventor of 35mm format and the designer of Leica cameras. This camera went up for auction in 2022, which if you add up all the Hasselblads on the moon at a million dollars a pop, it's still worth less than the final price of this camera. This sold for an unprecedented $15 million. Caterponia as the most expensive camera ever sold in history, which funny enough, the previous record holder of this title in 2018 was another Leica Zero, numbered 122, and that one sold for 2.95 million, which just slid by the previous holder of that title from 2012 at 2.8 million, which was also another Leica Zero. Now, if you're still interested in learning more about obscure random cameras, you should check out my video about the worst camera flops in history. In that video, I talk about more bizarre cameras that were total failures. Also, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And until next time, ciao.